Just wanted to remark that uh, in the closing comments of the conference, I also mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the lack of women in this sort of uh, area of research and suggested that more women come into this. So um, this part of the workshop has, has a lot of meaning for me uh, related to this. Yalila also, when she proposed the talk, remarked to me uh, why among more than 30 participants, I think there were like four women. And uh, I was trying to tell her that I was not being biased, but that I couldn't find a lot of women contributors. And so I I think it's really nice that we can have this this more feminine ending to the whole masculine track. Uh, and uh, I also want to remark, you know, the lack of studies in botany currently in the in the ayahuasca field, which is really outstanding, uh, especially if you consider this richness in natural varieties. There are very little papers, very few papers written about this topic. There's also the fact that ayahuasca has been transported to different places of the world. Uh, our presenter on Australia commented on how it was important to Australia. Another person commented on the fact that ayahuasca was brought to Hawaii. So all in these different places, ayahuasca grows differently and adapts differently. And as Kat was telling us, um, there is this kind of plant-human interaction where uh, the plant uh, grows depending on also the way we take care of it, and we are built by the plant ourselves, so very little has been written about this subject. And also, if you try to just translate what indigenous people are saying and the definitions they give, their classifications don't match our botanical classifications. And nobody talks about that. Nobody tries to do this cross-cultural equivalence. We have some sites that do this online, some ayahuasca retreat centers, but there is not really solid academic research, so this is a good tip. And with this, I want to pass the word to Yalila, who is a PhD, uh, and uh, the idea is that we contemplate in the track, as also I said in the opening, uh, light and shadow, and positive and negative, so also try to, to, to have a serious look about this uh, more problematic aspects, these reports on uh, eventual uh, you know, sex advances and improprieties on shamans. And, and so the idea was to bring to this to the table. This is also part of the, the complexity of being stigmatized and underground and so such a strong taboo, that clandestine. It's hard to address these things on a serious matter because a lot of political use can be, uh, negative can be done of this. But it's also important to bring this to the discussion. So I'm very happy that Yalila proposed this topic and I want to welcome her. I invite everyone to join me in taking a deep breath in your belly and imagining sending your energy down the 21 floors of this hotel and down in the concrete and down and down and down. I first would like to say a prayer of gratitude for these plants, these intelligent plant consciousness that have touched many of our hearts expanded our minds and brought us here together as well as gratitude for the teachers in human form that have shared their wisdom gracefully with all of us here thank you Bia for organizing this thank you everyone for being here with your open hearts and I'm really curious who's here. I know maybe half of you. Um, I'm just wondering, who is a researcher? 
would describe themselves as a researcher. So many, okay. And how about uh, therapist, um, counseling, what about uh, the plant world, botany, uh, geology, any, okay, uh-huh. And medicine, medical, doctor, physio, chiropractor, acupuncture. Yeah, okay. Lobbyist. Lobbyist, activist. <laughs> Activist. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So why why this topic? I went down to Peru seven years ago, nine years ago, and it was a dream that I had where a serpent bit me and I died. And I thought, why not go down to Peru and see if this is actually going to happen? I was, in that, <laughs> I was in that kind of state of mind. I was going through a very challenging time and ready to die in some ways. And so I just decided to see what would happen. And I expected to go through the agony that we sometimes hear about. And instead, it was ecstasy uh, for the whole night. And it, it made me curious. So I came back to... I guess Canada, and I decided to make some big changes in my life, and I left Vancouver and came down to California after, again, in a dream, I saw the, the Golden Gate Bridge, and I'm a sort of, I take things literally, like, you probably know by now that you're not supposed to do everything that you see, and that the plants tell you to do. <laughs> But I did it, and I left everything in Vancouver, came down to San Francisco, entered into the PhD program at CIS, and decided to go way in. I went down to Peru for a three-month diet in isolation. Um, were any of you here three years ago and heard me talk? Okay, so I'll keep it brief. So I was dieting there for three months, and the objective was to ask the plants what I should focus on for my research. And it was very clear. I got the message. I, again, took it literally, and I was shown its sexuality. And at first I was like, no, um, it's, too, it's too intimate. I don't really want to go there. But I decided to go there because they, it just wouldn't leave me alone. And so I came back to San Francisco, did the proposal, and um, things were flowing really well. Um, but what I forgot was that in sexuality there is a shadow side. And this became very challenging for me. I had to look at my own sexual shadow trauma that I experienced as a child. I seemed to be attracting everyone to me so that they could tell me their story of in Peru and here telling me that they were raped by their father and rape, gang raped and just like all these stories and it was quite overwhelming. Um, somehow I made it through and I realized that looking back when I worked in Vancouver as a, a perinatal counselor in maternity with women who had uh, substance misuse uh, problems. They were diagnosed with various mental health challenges. Um, many of them were street trade, sex trade workers, and um, had a variety of traumatic uh, memories. And that we'd be sitting in these case conferences and trying to figure out what to actually do. And half the time, no one really knew. It was an experiment. And I thought, we, we can do better than this. So bring it back to the PhD studies. I was like, OK, well, what is missing here? What is missing in our clinical treatment plan? A holistic view of, of women and sexuality. So I decided to go deeper into learning about vegetalismo. And I entered into a longer term plant diet. Um, do people know here what a plant diet is in the vegetalismo tradition? Okay, great. <clears throat> and 
So during that year, it was perfect because I lived in the forest. I could focus on the research, um, writing and ritual. Um, it was very quiet. I didn't go out that much. My friends and family were very upset with me um, during that time. It was a wonderful way to integrate academia and vegetalismo, which is very surprising for me. Um, so during this diet, I kept a dream journal. And one of the pluses of focusing on this area is that I was able to s interact with beings such as this being. And I'll just read you uh, this dream from my journal. A couple floats over and sits on my partner. I was ha taking a nap with my partner in waking time. Sits on my partner and explicit, explicitly revealed her vulva and penis and then gave, and he gave her a fellatio. I noticed for a brief second that the couple had wings and it appeared that they were from another planet. I was nervous because this was so odd, but I continued to watch in fascination. Like who, who wouldn't want to experience <laughs> something like this? Has anyone had this in an ayahuasca ceremony where you're interacting with a being of another planet in a sexual erotic way? A couple of you. Yeah. So I decided to interview women around North America who were considered experienced plant drinkers. That meant that they had been in at least 30 ayahuasca ceremonies and had dieted at least once in a three-month diet. And this was focused on the Shipibo Kanibo tradition. And there was, all the women had been connected with the same uh, ayahuasca holding these diets. So what would happen is um, I collected stories from these women who had dieted both in Peru and North America. So they would go down to Peru, open their diet, and then come back and be able to social diet, maintain their regular schedules with school and work, um, whatever children, however, still be ingesting whatever plant was given to them by the Iowa Scarrow holding their diet. And the time that people dieted varied. So anywhere from three months to a year. One woman had dieted for like off and on five years. Very experienced, I would say, in my opinion, um, in the dieting uh, practice. So I collected these stories and it took me about a year and uh, which it was traveling was difficult and schedules and very pleased to be part of their sacred storytelling and I just also want to say thanks to them for being able to um, share in such a graceful way with me. So One of my questions were, um, why are plants so special? Because many of these women had been to talk therapy, they went for acupuncture, ecstatic dance, um, everything that uh, is beautiful in our Western society that can help people. And what they said, one, one woman says, Plant medicines are special because many are very feminine and motherly, so it feels good for women. Herbs have been used for a long time, and many plants are used for re reproductive organs. The plants are very subtle, and I find it easier to integrate, especially if there's deep trauma. It's not shocking, but instead gentle. Another woman says, one of my deepest wounds I have is in the area of sexuality. I can go deeply to explore my wounds and the plants hold space for me and there's no judgment. So I divided all of these stories into four categories. 
into the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And there were seven core themes, and they were purification and support for reproductive health, increased sensory awareness, transformation of relationship with self, empowered decision-making, enhanced intimacy with others, enhanced cognitive awareness, and connecting with subtle energies in God. What was interesting is that I had, I tracked my biases and assumptions and I assumed I would be spending most of the time in the connecting with subtle energies in God. I was so wrong. Um, what I found was, or what I was reminded of, was that uh, sexuality is interwoven in all areas of these women's lives. And it was interesting that the majority of women I didn't know this beforehand, but they had a history of sexual trauma. So in some ways, it, it was a perfect sample. Also, I, I need to note, um, especially after Bia's comment yesterday, that this is a qualitative study gathering stories of women. This is not a clinical study proving anything. <clears throat> and. I was so impressed and pleased um, that so many women, all of them, talked about uh, experiencing purification and support for reproductive health. And one woman, this is a bit of storytelling, by the way, so just <laughs> think of yourself in a sharing circle and that hearing these women's voices. I really wanted to highlight their voices. <clears throat> One woman says, I knew that the sickness that ruled my life was a sexually oriented sickness. I had indeed endometriosis and pelvic and uterine pain all the time. I was supposed to get my uterus removed and had menstrual cycles where I was bleeding constantly for six months at a time. I had physical sickness that I knew was a result of sexual abuse as a child. For me, the Ahosacha cleaned up the cellular memory of the generations of sexual abuse. The morosa helped me deal with the grief, the emotions, and compassion that I needed to heal. And then another woman says, <clears throat> I received information during a ceremony that there was something growing on my ovary, which was confirmed by an ultrasound. A hysterectomy was suggested by the doctor, and instead I decided that I needed to work with plants. Boawaska was calling me. Three months after dieting Boawaska, I had an ultrasound that showed the cyst was decreasing, and ultimately the cyst was no longer there. So the other categories of emotional, mental, can you read that on the slide? Amazing, amazing transformations, recognizing self needs and power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I would like to jump to um, how the emotional and mental transformations translated into their uh, sexual behavior. And <clears throat> one woman says, before I started dieting, I had more partners than I want to mention. It was impulsive and the language of seeking. I think my sexuality before was evidence of how deep my sickness was, but also evidence of my desire to be healthy. I'm so much more aware of what it actually means to exchange energy. Another woman says, when I do engage again sexually, I want it to be more spiritual union than a pulling needy situation. I'm way more interested in quality. I want to know what decisions leave me the most empowered and leave me with the least regret. There is also a transformation in sexual identity. And one woman says, I'm a sexual being whether I'm having sex with someone or not. I don't need to feel like I'm excluding it, but that I know it's my nature. And as I empower myself by being aware of my inherent nature, a shift into fun-loving experiences is possible. I get to leave behind the garbage idea that I was a whore if I enjoyed sex. And so the next category, spiritual. 
They spoke about unions with spirits in the subtle realm, learning discernment between positive and negative energies, discovering sexual energy as life force, and increased communication with one's soul and God. Several of the women spoke about this phenomena of spirit marriages. I'm sure all of you have heard of it. <laughs> so Maya says, when I dieted Ahosacha, he told me that we were going to be lovers and that our worlds were going to be interconnected. From everything mundane is doing the dishes to things as complicated as spirit traveling and my healing work. I asked him, what's in it for you? Why would you clean me out? The answer was the human body is the most incredible playground you can maintain if you can maintain an environment without salt or sugar so that I can stay in your body. To see things from a human perspective in a human body, to be able to move in a way that I've never been able to move before. And so this is highlighting the light aspects of the research that I found and obviously there were the shadow stories. And many of the women talked about sexual seduction in the form of various beings during ayahuasca ceremonies as well as during their plant diets in dream time. One woman says, I've had encounters where spirits have come through and I was feeling an erotic charge with these spirits. Sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative and based on the dynamics of these interactions, I'll guard myself from it if it is expressed in a negative sense or be open to it if it's in a positive sense. And I learned when spirits were trying to seduce me and that it was a huge red flag that something is trying to get in. I feel different a dark energy trying to get in during dream time or visions that come in the form of a man seducing me. I had experience where a man would touch me and I froze and I couldn't get him off me. I lost all my power. Has anyone experienced this in a ceremony or dream time? No. So they also spoke about the se sexual uh, abuse that happens within ceremonies. And one of the participants said that she actually stopped a diet as soon as she found out that this teacher had um, sexually molested someone else in a ceremony. And she spoke about power and accountability. And I would love your feedback afterwards on this because I am not uh, sure how to respond and have more accountability for ayahuascaros. So she says, with power comes responsibility and that's where accountability comes in. The more power you have, the more humble you need to be. The scariest part is that shamans are not accountable to anyone because they have reached a point where they're so strong in their power. It's sad that women have to be so careful about where they need, where they go for healing. We can be wounded in the same area that we need healing. It's such a shame. So, Electra. Um, spoke about the need for safety in ceremony. And she says, I think that shaman facilitators who abuse their power sexually during ceremonies are taking vital energy from women. In many ways, that's the worst transgression. There are all these people coming to you who are really clear with lots of vital energy and they mistake the medicine for the person pouring the medicine. There are a disproportionate number of women going to ceremonies who have a history of sexual trauma and how interesting that they are the ones practitioners tend to take advantage of. When you're in a position of power, there's really no such thing as consent when there are psychotropics involved. So one of the women asked me to include this in the presentation. She thought it was so important. She spoke about learning about her own power and wanted to communicate this to all women. 
Something really important for people to know is how powerful they are, a w power that can be used in many ways or can be given away. There is definitely a power play that goes on with sexuality, a really, a really knowing what is true and trusting our discernment. And Electra says, if we are empowered sexually, spiritually, mystically, emotionally, and intellectually, we have the means not only to protect ourselves and safeguard ourselves from acts of violence, but actually be empowered in power. Until we embrace the feminine principle, we'll be trapped, entrapped in the cycle of violence. So I receive emails after the 2010 gathering from all over the world. People uh, sharing their stories, asking me where to go that's safe in Peru. And at that point, I actually, because I was in my own dieting bubble, I didn't know. And so I would refer them to blogs and internet sites and friends that I knew in Peru that were living there. And so I just wanted to include this slide um, for guidelines uh, for spiritual seekers. And the five areas, information to educate uh, yourself and which many of the women and men too who were um, looking for a safe place to go. And one thing that just dawned on me recently is the uh, importance of asking the organizers. The organizers have the organizing um, person who is um, running the ceremonies for the ayahuascaro or the healer has an ethical responsibility as well to let people know if there is something that plant drinkers should know in terms of the safety or harm issues. Uh, number two, intention. So the ayahuascaros may not change their behavior, and I actually spoke with many of them down in, in South America, and we talked about the cultural differences, and they said, what's the big deal? Why are you making such a fuss? Um, you're coming down here and expecting everything, and we give you everything, and um, this is just the way it is. So, okay. Um, we have a responsibility then to respond to that by educating ourselves, being aware. And also, I encourage people to look at your own inner prostitute archetype. Because we as Westerners go there looking for healing. We want it and we think that if we give money that we deserve it. And we have our own biases and assumptions around that as well. So what are we willing to sacrifice for power and for healing? And some women who are dear friends of mine have admitted to having sexual relations with a shaman so that they could learn. And they were saying that they chose to do it. It was consensual. And they were aware of the risk factors. And she was willing to look at what was she going to exchange for that knowledge? Number three, inspire. Be inspired to empower yourself. Know that you have the choice of where you go to drink, how much you drink. So say there's three ceremonies in a week. You don't have to go for those three ceremonies. More is not better. And also, I want to empower people that when you sit in front of a healer, yes, they are people who work with integrity and are connected well with their guides, will be receiving information about how much to give someone. And based on what I, the stories that I'm hearing, that not everyone is working in integrity. And I have heard of Iowa Scaros who will give more medicine to women that they would like to try being sexual with in ceremony and um, also giving, uh, putting in other plants into the brew that will have the women more disoriented or whatever. So 
my encouragement is that follow your intuition, your bodily information that's telling you, wait a minute, I don't want to drink this much. I don't want to drink it last minute. I don't want to drink at all. You, you don't need to trust the healer all the time. And I may get slack for <laughs> saying this. It's just my, it's my opinion. <clears throat> and five, involve community. So encourage people in your, in your community to dialogue about issues that you feel are important if people are feeling unsafe, if they have had a difficult time in South America and come back and need that support. It's actually, we've, we've become a ceremony-centric society looking for the Big Bang and instead it's actually the in-between the integration that really the work is is done and also because i shared these stories about the women that i interviewed i encourage the men in this audience and whoever listens to this that you have a pitiful 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 <laughs> an important role <laughs> however you say that and, Pivotal, pivotal, pivotal. Um, because these women, they're your, they're your family members, they're your friends, they're your lovers, and this affects the community in all levels. And if this is growing, if there's this desire to have a greater connection with our soul or our guides or God, whatever you want to call it, then as a community we need to be more aware and supportive of each other if this is going to continue in a good way and oh so also as a community how do we look at our sacred future what are some things that we can encourage each other to channel our energy into. And one is, um, I'm interested in expanding research on plant diets and reproductive health. And two, educational workshops. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Erie. That was here, some people, no one heard it. <laughs> right, so this is a, a group um, at CIS. And the beauty of this group is that they organize people um, to give educational lectures and to have integration circles for people, uh, anyone, I think it's open to the public. And um, there's research and this idea of um, an Athegian school in the future. And enhanced support for integration in community circles, ethical guidelines through alliance. I believe it is possible to create a guideline, a code of ethics for practitioners both in South America and North America. Um, this idea that all circles are safe and beneficial in North America, I feel is not true. There are practitioners here that I are not working in integrity and um, it's been challenging for me in terms of how to disseminate information and um, because there is this, there's a backlash that can happen and there's a lot of gossiping and storytelling that goes around the communities. It's amazing how fast one email with a letter from someone can reach uh, all over North America in a week. And um, so I believe that communities can organize themselves and create a code of ethics that we can all follow. I, I, don't, I don't buy into this idea that cultural differences are, going, are okay in terms of um, allowing for unsafe circumstances and ceremonies to happen in South America. I feel that it is completely unethical and irresponsible to have anyone that's harmed in a ceremony or during a diet. So four points, if you can remember just these. One, reproductive health um, and sexual abuse trauma can be 
healed with plant teachers for some people. Again, this isn't a clinical study, but this is something that I believe. And the women who I interviewed shared their uh, belief in this too. Number two, that in order to maximize the benefits of these plant teachers, there needs to be preparation and integration. So again, emphasizing that the before and after is just as important as the ceremony. Number three, practitioners must be accountable and work in integrity for the benefit of their patients. And for me, I've been looking into this area personally, experientially, um, supporting people in individual sessions and in group work. And it's been, it's been seven year journey of actually feeling compassion for all parties. Because at first I thought that the practitioner was to blame and that they were, you know, the the evil ones and actually for healing for myself and the other women they said that when they saw the victim and the perpetrator archetype within themselves that that's when the healing began and so these curanderos ayahuascaros healers are actually holding a really important piece for all of us that they i truly believe that somewhere in their hearts they are wanting to heal and yet they are wounded very wounded and benefiting from sucking out vital life force from these spiritual seekers who, who simply just want healing. Um, and we all have a role in this. It's not just, there's, we're all victims and perpetrators, I feel, in some way. And number four, sexual spiritual vitality will liberate us collectively into a new realm of consciousness so that these energies coming from the earth mixed with the heaven energies into these plants which we ingest are actually opening our hearts that will lead us into our ascension into another level of consciousness and I welcome a heated debate if people have uh, stories or um, you feel that I've said something that doesn't fit with you. So I'm just going to follow the, the principle of asking some people to talk and then open the question. Uh, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, three donors for our workshop, Richard Wolf. Giancarlo Canavesio from Mangu TV and Matthew Wat Watterson from the Temple of the Way of the Light. Actually, he's sitting right there. Would you stand up, Matthew, please? I would like an applause for him. <laughs> he gave $2,000 for support for this event. Uh, so uh, we're going to make uh, some questions and, and answers, but following the spirit as the previous presenters, I just wanted to give the opportunity to some people that also have high uh, expertise and that are, you know, for reasons of life not here presenting, if they want to add something, like was the case with Charlie and uh, Evelyn. So the people I thought that have been doing a lot of empirical work here, El señor uh, Francisco Montes, si usted desea hablar algo sobre este tema muy breve, que estamos hablando de las propiedades, de los abusos que algunos curanderos hacen con las mujeres. No sé si usted desea venir a hablar. And maybe Matthew or Joe was also doing, uh, you know, our back, back there in Peru. If they want to give a little talk, very short, to contribute for our forum, if they have any remarks, uh, they would be welcomed. Desea usted, usted hablar algo uh, sobre este tema de las mujeres y de los problemas con curanderos. No es obligado, ¿no? Es una invitación nada más. Sí. Entonces usted habla y yo traduzco, pero breve. Por sí, favor. sí, sí. Ah, gracias también por darme otra vez la nueva oportunidad. Thanks for the new opportunity y, for me to speak. Bueno, realmente está, estamos en, esta, en una época de este, de este sufrimiento de realmente 
se sabe ahora muchas cosas que está sucediendo. Unfortunately, we are witness of a lots of problems that people are going through suffering. Ah, uh, realmente esta medicina que eh, ayahuasca que nosotros como curanderos tradicionales respetamos su disciplina enormemente. We as traditional ayahuasqueros respect the discipline of ayahuasca. Es triste también, bueno, yo yo también ya he sabido de estas de estas cosas que está pasando en la selva, ¿no? It's sad. I, I've also heard stories about this kind of uh, things that are happening in the jungle. A veces por culpa de 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 estos maestros indisciplinados, ¿no? That's due to the lack of discipline of this kind of maestro. Todos ya estamos incluidos en esas cosas, en esas cosas malas que pasan, ¿no? It affects all of us this sort of bad thing that is going on. Eh, no es mucho tiempo que ha pasado estas cosas con una señorita creo que de Alemania, eso fue en Iquitos. In Iquitos not very long ago there were some problems like this to a, with a girl from Germany. En pocas palabras quiero decirles que realmente hay que tener mucho cuidado con quienes especialmente las mujeres van a hacer estas experiencias. So I, I really think that women should really take care with whom they are going to sit in ceremony. A qué lugares se va a hacer estas experiencias, ¿no? Donde va uh, where where she's going to go. Eso de mi parte quiero des, uh, suplicarles también hay que saber con qué maestro, qué garantía tiene ese maestro, ¿no? It's important to check who is the maestro, who is the teacher, the I was quiero what are the guarantees that he bueno, hay, hay, ahora se ha resultado miles de, de, de ayahuasqueros, ¿no? curanderos, ¿no? Because there are thousands of ayahuasqueros uh, or healers. Maestros que se dicen de 20 años, 28 años, no, pero realmente de esas clases de maestros pues no están disciplinados. ¿no? Well, this kind of uh, healers, some of them have a long experience, but some of them don't have discipline. Y por eso es que de todas maneras hay que tener cuidado en eso, ¿no? So we have to be careful. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, does uh, Joe or, or Matthew or one is pointing to the other? You go. No, you go. It's not. It's not supposed to be a sort of uh, punishment. It's an opportunity. Just briefly, I guess I, I want to say a couple things. First, I think that. Uh, that our center and Matt Center, Temple of the Way of Light, I think it's kind of known in the area, to speak about Matthew for a second, for being a place that's there in response to this problem, to be a safe place where uh, there's a lot of uh, female shamans there is, is one of the things that's known. Our center is also a center that opened in response to this problem and to be a safe place. And so I think that uh, the big, for me, being down there, you know, you don't really, and, uh, and Francisco can probably correct me, uh, you don't see this problem too much among the Peruvians, you know, why? Because the community, the, the traditional healer, the shaman responds to a community. It's not an anonymous situation. So everybody knows, and all the Peruvian ladies know that this is an issue that you have to watch out for. So like Francisco Montes is telling you right here, right now, this is an issue you have to watch out for in this realm, in this region. And if you're not thinking about that, and if you're not aware of that, you're, you're being ignorant at this point, you know, because the issue is here. So this is a chance for us to all to educate you and remind you that if you were a Peruvian woman, you would already know this as a child. They would have told you, you would have been very aware to be careful with guys, period, that with men you have to build trust, you know, not blindly, and, and under the influence of a substance, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be very careful. So I think the big issue is then traveling shamans or people who don't explore the community around a shaman, you know, so we allow for this anonymous piece to, to exist, perhaps to allow for some of these other things to play out, you know, let's say this whether it's just sexual misconduct and abuse or somebody's inner prostitute you know, complex or whatever it is, to allow the shadow elements to play out in the anonymity. You know? And so I think the most important thing is to clear up the anonymity. You know, this is standard. If you're gonna meet a shaman that's coming through your area, these, this is a normal question. Does this person have any history of sexual misconduct? That is a completely legitimate, inoffensive question. 
if somebody comes, that's what they ask us at our center. Is Ricardo, has he, has he get, you know, personally been involved in any of that? And so we respond, you know, transparently, and that's how it is. There are shamans that are run out of villages and run out of communities for what they're doing where they live. There is consequences. That's it. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for that. And uh, I would like to open the, the questions for Yalila. Uh, if you want to come here and please just address your question in the microphone. We'll take a few and she will respond. Uh, one quick question, if you can expand a little bit on plant diet. Thank yes. You. So I am knowledgeable only about the vegetalismo practice of plant diets with the Shipibo Kanibo. And there are a variety of types of diets. They can range from, we've all heard of the pre and post ceremony diets. This is a little different. This is, can be a month, up to a year. There's healing diets, so someone can go to South America and the ayahuasquero can choose the plant that would be most appropriate for the person to diet, say they're healing a skin rash or cancer or something. And traditionally, the diets were completed in isolation in the jungle, but things have really changed. So anyone can go down to a center and explain what they're looking for, and the Iowa girl can work with that person to heal physical, emotional, spiritual imbalances. Oh, and the diets are opened and closed in ceremony. Forgot to say, so that's a little bit different than say, you hear about the, the cleanses, the plant cleanses here in North America. It's, it's a very different concept. So uh, given that most accountability processes derive their power and legitimacy from the fact that they occur within the context of a community that can exercise certain actions and interactions, uh, especially with the people bringing issues and being held accountable. I was kind of curious if you had any thoughts as to what an accountability process might look like within this sort of global tourist paradigm and if such a thing is even possible to really carry out. Uh, I'm Rob Heffernan. I've been involved with organizing and legal work around the Santo Daime and now with Curandero Circles. Um, and I just wanted to underscore what you said about um, people rationalizing um, the cultural differences. The same thing was said about certain Buddhist and yogic teachers too, their cultural differences or their status. But you know, the, these precepts around sexual misconduct and ethics have been around for thousands of years, so it, it isn't something specific to our culture or our time. Um, and myself, like other people in the US, have encountered these issues in the Santo Daime and in Curandero circles, and it's really you know, played a big role in ripping apart certain communities, but it's also been a lesson in, in maturation in how to, to begin to address these things and address all these shadows, so I really appreciate you doing that in this conference. Thank you. Accountability process. First of all, with uh, greater community dialogue, just education and information through various sites, a website, maybe uh, someone mentioned yesterday having, um, creating a website where there are current Daryls listed and people go in and they just give a review of what's working and what's not and have red flags for issues that have created harm, people have experienced harm. Uh, in terms of practitioners gathering together and creating a code of ethics with the support of other researchers and organizations, that there would be a way of educating people and also to, in numbers, having the strength to say, we are not hosting this 
Corundero in our communities uh, for, I mean, I'm talking about North America. In South America, I actually, I don't know. Does anyone have an idea? Accountability in South America? Well, right, we have the choice to go or not go into the center. But what's amazing is how many people have contacted me, I tell them what's going on, and they still go. Why is that? What are they looking for? Is it power? I, I, I'd, I'd like to give my, my thought on that as well. Uh, I share the same impression. There's you know, some famous uh, healers that are involved in um, scandals and problems, and nevertheless, you know, their audience is still there. So I ask myself this question, why? Why, why are people going there? And basically, I, I think it's a lot of rationalization, as it was said here, because the fact is that people are eager to have these experiences, and there are few mediators. It's hard to go to Peru. A lot of people don't have money. They don't speak Spanish. <laughs> and they, you know, some of the folks that are around, they are accessible. They are the ones that are also involved in those stories. So, but it's a little bit like if you really like to eat a certain cake in that certain bakery, and then you hear, you know, that the guy, the owner of the bakery, he expects his wife once in a while. And you say, well, that's kind of a bummer, but I love that cake, so I'm going to have that cake. <laughs> the problem is that people don't want to, you know, just uh, quit that wonderful access to that magical, enchanted world uh, that they have access through that person. And so I think it's, it's, it's like any sort of consumerist uh, responsibilities. You have to check the product you're getting involved with and where does it come from and... Uh, this sort of thing. I, I would like to see, to ask more people, invite more people to, to make questions. Please, can you come? Um, I'm just one, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, oh, I'm, I'm Rusty, uh, just uh, here today, psychiatrist uh, from Houston. I was w wondering you know, if we can expect the um, sexual indiscretions um, to be completely, to be, have, be void of that. Um, I mean, in, in psychiatry, there are the strong prohibitions against um, patient cli or physician client sexual interactions, and yet, still, with that, with um, people being trained in um, transference, counter transference, it still happens. I've, I've had two colleagues over the years that have been caught up in that, and not predators on a general basis, not evil people, but have caught up in that dynamic. And I imagine there are some, some um, shamans or curanderos who might be just predators by nature and looking for the next score, but I imagine also that in this openness and intense sexual energy between someone who's learning and someone who's supposed to be teaching, that there's that trap that is going to be a temptation for many, many people, even if they even when they're trained to, to avoid it and have those boundaries. Yes. That's what I meant by we're all responsible because until we have that power, and I can't even imagine what that feels like and we're tested, I'm not going to throw a stone at them. I can say clearly that I think it's unethical to for a shaman to um, sexually molest someone in the, in the, in the Maloka. Yes, I'm very clear on that. However, there are so many layers here, and I've heard that many of the, not many, a few of the Ayahuascaros have had themselves possibly being sexually molested themselves, being within the Catholic Church um, dynamic. And so, and I just thought of this, that when people going, go to the center, there is something, it's like our greater soul is leading us to places to exactly where we need to be to act out our own shadow that needs to be expressed in, in some kind of unfolding drama. So that everyone is responsible. And in terms of people choosing certain centers, I also ask the question, yeah, maybe there's one or two women that have been sexually assaulted 
in a center, well then why is it that all the men also continue to go to the same center? And I'm not saying that men, men may also be sexually assaulted. I haven't heard of that, but I'm guessing it has happened. And also that it's not just male Iowa scarrows, female Iowa scarrows can also both in South America and North America be tempted as well. So I just, it brings back the question of how do we hold each other in a community? Is it okay one person's being picked on or raped or whatever, well it's just them and it's not me and I want to go for the big you know, circus or have this amazing vision so I'm going to continue I'm doing what I want to do. You know, that's our ethnocentric Western sense of I'm entitled, right? Thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Joshua. I am a sustain an international voluntary sustainability standards practitioner. I've worked for many years in organizational accountability, transparency, and I've been talking to everyone that I have a chance to about mechanisms to improve the sustainability and the accountability in the ayahuasca community. And I just wanted to share some ideas that have come up and see what you think. Um, I think the, the code of ethics has come up quite a bit and it's tied with safety, site safety. Um, and there's perhaps the chance to have globally agreed ethics um, since ayahuasca is a global phenomenon or becoming a global phenomenon. While we're having that dialogue, we can p possibly also talk about the sustainability of production of ayahuasca, the, s the retreat centers, uh, how the workers are paid, uh, how the garden is cultivated. And people have thrown out ideas like, what if, um, you know, what if there's something like Bob Jesse's been talking about, like very non-hierarchical forms of organization uh, that sort of like a, a council or a rotating council maybe with an ombudsman or that sort of role that when there are complaints about someone in the community a shaman or that it can be worked out it doesn't need to be thrown out into the um into the wider public um and that creating a, a community where there are uh, transparent, ob uh, objective guidelines. The, the shamans or the, the retreat centers that are acting more responsibly can filter to the top and can be s certified or accredited in some way. Those words carry a lot of baggage, but um, I just wanted to throw that out there and come see me if you want to talk to talk about it more and I'd love to get your thoughts on that. That reminds me that I would love to have your email and anyone here who wants to continue the conversation and brainstorming. I have a sheet right here. Please um, add your email. And the other thing that I want to point out that's interesting about this discussion is I just gave you the light and shadow of sexuality and plants and we've been focusing on the shadow. Did anyone <laughs> resonate with like the beauty of healing sexuality with these plants. This is like something I'm so excited about and would love to collaborate with people and fundraise to do more research in terms of what is what are the possibilities of these precious plants, not only in South America, but our local plants here within the vegetalismo plant diet structure in terms of healing things like ovarian cysts um, that an infertility that um, people have been taking these medications for. Um, I looked up the stats and for 2012, I think there were two million women who were diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Does any, can anyone tell me exactly the stat? But um, that's incredible. And so how many of these women are being medicated? And I don't know, I'm not a doctor, I don't know um, how these women are experiencing their healing process, but based on the, the research of these women, there's just such potential for another way, a slower, deep, gentle way of healing. 
Okay, everybody, we've come to the end. Okay, you want to speak? Almost in the end. Great job, Yalila, thank you. I wanted to speak to that specifically. My name is Natalie Metz, I'm a student at CIIS, which is how Yalila and I know each other. Hi, Jeff. And I'm also a naturopathic doctor, and I want to speak specifically to that around reproductive health and um, what I'm seeing in clinical practice is that largely, well, there's certainly an element of the psycho-spiritual illness that's pervasive in our culture, but there's also a very real influence of the environmental toxicity that's literally mounting in our tissues and really affecting reproductive health. So a lot of the patients that I see with ovarian cysts and miscarriages and whatnot have not only some mental, emotional, spiritual process that needs some support, but there's also this physical toxicity coming in from the environment. And I feel that in particular, ayahuasca being known as La Purga is this amazing medicine that can help to extract not only those psycho-spiritual, emotional illnesses and toxins, but also help us with this environmental toxicity that we're dealing with at an alarming rate. And um, also bring forth the consciousness to help us choose to prioritize taking care of our environment and loving the earth and cleaning it up and promoting the plant wisdom. So just wanted to offer that. Thank you. I think that's a very good quote to end our marathon of more than 30 presentations on ayahuasca for four days on a row. <laughs> So I, I want to thank everybody, invite you again to look at my books here, uh, look at Clancy's art. I also have a website, bialabate.net. I offer a newsletter that is free where I send news about Ayahuasca World. And uh, my sincere thanks and I guess as the Beatles song say, we all want to change the world. So thanks a lot. Can we maybe just get like a little standing ovation for all the hard work that Bia's put in for the last year?